Good evening to you. Well, the World Cup starts in Argentina tomorrow. Three and a half weeks that have been eagerly looked forward to by millions of us. Three and a half weeks when the world's greatest footballers will parade their skills in the world's most demanding arenas. Three and a half weeks when it's going to be difficult to get the children to bed on time and when weeds will flourish in many a garden. Let's not kid ourselves as well. Three and a half weeks when there will be countless arguments in countless homes about whether to watch the World Cup at all. Tonight, we're going to try and convince you that you should watch the World Cup on television. And in the next hour, we should be bringing you an every man's down-to-earth guide, every woman's too, uh, to the World Cup. The teams to watch, the players to watch, how it all works, and indeed the emotion of it all. Why, for example, was this player reduced to tears in front of a television audience this week? That story later on. We shall, of course, be concentrating on Scotland's hopes. Do they really have a chance of lifting the trophy won by West Germany in 1974, the day that Franz Beckenbauer will long remember? And the man Beckenbauer beat in the last World Cup, Johan Cruyff of Holland, greatest footballer in the world, he's with us tonight, naming the teams to watch and their problems. And Kevin Keegan, who knows the world's best players as friends as well as opponents, he'll be naming his six to follow. And to add to it all, Brian Clough, manager of the year, the most respected voice in football. He's got a word of warning tonight for all Scottish fans who believe that something magical happens when a player pulls on that Scottish shirt with the famous Scottish badge on it. No, there's no such thing as badge seeing anybody through. Um, I saw a clip of an interview that Ali did before I went on holiday. And he was having problems in this week of home internationals and he put his hand over his heart and covered the Scotland badge and said, this is the thing that will make them tick and that's a bloody load of rubbish. <laughs> well, much more of Brian Clough later on. But the World Cup, it is a complicated business. Let me try and sort out one or two things for you right away. Fourteen nations have battled their way through just to be to Argentina with qualifying games over the last uh, two years. They join two nations who qualify automatically, Argentina, the host country, and West Germany, the holders. They're divided into four groups of four, and in group one, we have Argentina, France, Hungary, and Italy. They all play each other once, remember, and the top two go through to the second round. Now, in group two, there's Mexico, Poland, West Germany, and Tunisia. The top two there also go through. Two points for a win, remember, one for a draw. Goal difference decides if the points total is the same. Group three. Here we have Austria, Brazil, Spain and Sweden. The top two go through here as well to the second round. And then in group four, the one Britain's most interested in, and here we have Holland, Iran, Peru and, of course, Scotland. That, in simple terms, is how the first round operates. And if Scotland are one of the two teams to qualify for that second round, they go into one of two groups of four nations, Group A and Group B. Again, they all play each other once, and the winners of Group A play the winners of Group B in the World Cup final on June the 25th. There's no such thing as semi-finals or quarter-finals this time. You've also got to get used to one or two places with strange-sounding names. Uh, though the final itself, as I've said, is in the capital, in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, in the River Plate Stadium, where today they were rehearsing again for tomorrow's opening ceremony. And you can see that live, remember, here on ITV at 5.45 tomorrow evening, followed by the opening match, West Germany against Poland again, live on ITV. That one's at 7 o'clock. But early on, the emphasis for Scottish fans will be on Cordoba and Mendoza, where they play their matches in Group 4. Scotland's headquarters are closest to the town of Cordoba, which is some 400 miles from Buenos Aires, basically an agricultural area, population of about a million. Uh, they're truly geared, though, to the World Cup industry as well, and the town itself has given the inhabitants, the inhabitants rather, have given the Scottish team a very warm welcome indeed. But is their confidence well placed? Just how good are Scotland's chances? Nine months ago, I suppose everyone would have said, well, not too bad at all. At about that time, they virtually made sure of their place in the finals with an emphatic victory over the European champions Czechoslovakia at Hampden Park. Here is Scotland. They are wearing the dark shirts. Green is on the goal line, causing trouble there. Tenny Dalglish, Rioch, Hartford, good play by the Scots, Willie Johnston, Joe Jordan's on the far side, oh and the goalkeeper's lost it, and Hartford has put it in, 2-0. Matt 
Assen again. Good high corner. Fist of the keeper. Jardine with the header. And it's in there. It's Kenny Dalvish. Try to check for Czechoslovakia. Nehoda. Leaving the ball behind. Try to check again. Left foot. Goal! More recently, though, Scottish morale has been badly dented. In the home international championship, they lost their title to England. Uh, they failed to win a single game, even though everyone was played at Hampden Park. And their week started with a 1-1 draw against Northern Ireland. Jimmy Nicholl. Good running by McCreary. Ball on to Armstrong, and he's in behind Scotland. Stopped. He could be in for it. Needs a chip. A shot. From O'Neill. And a goal. one nothing Ireland. And Ireland are now streaming back. Not too many targets forward to aim for. Ball chipped in for Johnston. Got to be. Absolutely had to be. Against Wales, Scotland led right to the end of the game. But then, what a clangor. And now, here's a break. Douglas on to Gemmell. Johnston, 1-0. Here's the corner. Harris in. And the goal. It's a penalty given. It's a penalty given. The chance for Wales to draw level. Three minutes to go to the end of the game. Brian Flynn looking for 1 1 for Wales. He's hit the post. Well, this is definitely Scotland's night. Seventy thousand Scotsmen. Oh, oh! An own goal by Willie Donaghy. That's the most remarkable goal that's ever been scored, surely here at Hampton, and it's one-one. Look at that, the roll ball. Willie Donaghy, who's never scored for Scotland, has now scored for Wales. One-one. But the biggest blow of all, of course, was that defeat against the old enemy, England, at Hampden Park. Now Hartford is fighting there to prevent England getting in a shot. Now it's Barnes. Floated in there again, and Ruff's in trouble, and Coppola has put it into the net, and England are in the lead. And to add to their growing problems, Scotland also lost uh, Gordon McQueen, their big central defender, damaged knee ligaments in a collision that's coming up here with a goalpost at Hampden Park. This was the game against Wales, and he is certainly out of Saturday's match against Peru. <coughs> so it has been an enormous gamble by Ali McLeod taking Gordon McQueen, who might not even play in a single game out there in Argentina. Even so, the spirit in the Scottish camp seems to be pretty good as their testing time gets closer and as we see in this report from Hugh Johns. The Scottish team looked sharp and eager to get on with the real business of the World Cup when they trained on a practice pitch alongside the main stadium at Cordoba. With Willie Donachy suspended and unable to play in the opener against Peru, it seems likely that Martin Buchan will take over at left back. He looked fit and fully recovered from the injury he picked up in the match against Ireland. All Ali McLeod's midfielders are fighting fit, and Asa Hartford found it easy to stroke passes around on turf identical to the main stadium that was firm and true. Hartford had a fine game against England, which should book him a midfield spot against Peru. Still, it's a fair guess that manager McLeod will not try any experiments when he faces the Peruvians on Saturday. He did concentrate particular attention to shooting practice, and with the first game now so close, there's plenty of pressure on the Scottish players and manager Ali McLeod. So I miss my wife and family, which anyone would naturally do, but uh, I'm quite happy. I'm happy with a good bunch of lads and enjoy doing it. And it hasn't changed me one iota, you know, I'm quite relaxed. Hands very, very steady. One of the things that the local press have made uh, plenty of is the fact that you haven't bothered in your preparation to go to see Iran, Peru and Holland in any great detail. Why in fact did you decide not to see the other teams? Well basically uh, the games, first of all, Peru was away on the other side of the world and I was still in the preparations of my own squad, getting uh, my own 22, making sure that I was picking the right 22. 
Iran came in the, the middle of the home championships. But I have absolute full details. Mike Smith from Wales was good enough to give me the rundown in Iran. I've watched the tapes of Peru and Argentina and Peru and Brazil, and I know about them, but I feel myself in the World Cup. You can prepare by becoming too dossier-minded. And what I've decided to do is to try and win the World Cup by preparing my own team to perfection. Mm. And if my own team is at perfection, we'll let everyone else worry about Scotland. Helmut Schoen made a point, uh, I don't know whether you noticed it in the paper or not here, that uh, in the last World Cup, Scotland played against Zaire as if it was, quote, their last practice match, unquote. Is there any danger of that kind of slightly negative <coughs> thinking getting into the players' heads or yours for Saturday? No, I think this World Cup's different from the last World Cup. In the last World Cup, we had Zaire, we had Yugoslavia, and we had uh, Brazil. And the point was, it, all hinged, it was all going to hinge and go average, it looked like. And when they only beat Zaire 2 nothing, everyone said, oh, that's terrible. I would set up for beating Peru 1 nothing or 2 nothing because in this section, if you win your first two games, you're through. Mm. And uh, that's what we aim to try and do, is to get it over, get the strain off us and go out and we could possibly play the Holland game as a practice game. Uh, the fans, I don't think, have ever before been so pro-Scottish back home. I wonder if you're slightly worried about the possibility of letting them down. No, I think... What Kenny Burns said in the bus to Presswick, when we were all lined the bridges and the roads, he said, you know, playing for Scotland is more than playing for yourself. And he is the same managing Scotland. I'm managing Scotland not for myself. I mean, I've been a manager for 13 years. I'm managing Scotland for five million people back home. And I, I, won't, I hope make many mistakes on their behalf. And I'm sure that the players realise that they're not just playing for Kenny Burns, Aza Hartford, or whoever it may be. They're playing for five million people. And we all know that. I will do my utmost to bring back the result that uh, 5 million people want and to everyone back home at the television, keep your fingers crossed and as I say, God willing that uh, the result will be what we all want and, and don't drink too many, shall we say, exports and stay awake and see the next game, that's all I would say, you know. He sounds in good heart. The interviewer there was Arthur Monfort, Ali McLeod, of course, who's had plenty to say for himself over the past 12 months, which brings us to a man who's had virtually nothing to say for himself over the past three years. Brian Clough, Manager of the Year, the most talked-about man in football, the man who's got strong opinions about the World Cup as well. What does he think of Scotland's chances? Uh, it's a difficult question, and I'm not evading it at all, because if I felt it would be knocked out in the first round as such, I'd tell you so. But I don't know that much about Peru, I think it is, and Iran, is it, in their group? Uh, what I do know is that the last few days they were in England wasn't the best preparation. The um, home international weeks weren't good for them. I hope he's got a settled side, and I hope he picks a side that the World Cup requires. Uh, by that I mean that I hope he picks the people with the, the most skill. Like who? Well, John Robertson didn't have a too good a, a home international week. It was his first match. But he is the type of player that will be needed at top level. Why is that? What's he got particularly? Well, he's got a, he's got a quicker brain than most footballers for a start. A lot of people are blinded by uh, footballers, by how fast they can run, how good they look and all that type of thing. Well, if that applied to John Robertson, you know, he wouldn't even get on an aeroplane, let alone be playing in the World Cup squad. Uh, his brain is, you know, I, I, that's much faster than most players and he should be playing in a side that can use him. Is that the thing that we shall see in Argentina? The game played maybe at, at a slower rate but the brain moving at 90 miles an hour? It'll appear as though it's slower. Good players or good, good people at any profession, it's the brains that work quicker than most people and it's the legs that look as though they're slower. Mm. But they're only, you know, it's the brains that make the decision. I think that opinion of yours will surprise a lot of people because John Robertson really seemed to get on the boat or on the plane as an afterthought. Um, I, think he, I think he's gone as reserve to Willie Johnson, but having played or managed John, uh, John Robertson now for three years, and uh, with no bias whatsoever, uh, he's a far, far superior player to Willie Johnson. Did Ellie McLeod seek any guidance from you about John Robertson's abilities? Um, I asked him when he was coming, and he did come to a, a couple of matches where John didn't play too well, but I think, I'm not so sure it was guidance, he asked for an opinion and I gave it to him, that in the sense that I felt that John Robertson was a highly skilled, talented player suited to the World Cup, and suited to any side uh, in any competition, 
And if I helped to get John Robinson on the plane, then I did Scotland a hell of a service. Mind you, in Scotland, it's filled with euphoria at the moment, uh, and you hear and rightly so. And you hear people saying that even if they don't play all that well, the badge will see them through. No, there's no such thing as badge seeing anybody through. Um, I saw a clip of an interview that Ali did before I went on holiday. And he was having problems in this week of home internationals and he put his hand over his heart and covered the Scotland badge and said, this is the thing that will make them tick and that's a bloody l l load of rubbish. Badges don't make people tick at all. Ability makes people tick. Um, cohesion, blend, talent, and then the badge and the shirt just add to it. But if you put 11 shirts on 11 dummies, they couldn't win a Tuesday morning practice match. If you put 11 shirts on 11 proficient Scottish players, can you see somehow how they could win the World Cup? They have pride, obviously, uh, which helps enormously. Uh, the desire to do well is there also, but that's nullified because every other side is desire to do well is the same. Um, I think if we get over the first hurdle, and I want to say we right from the start, because we aren't split, the fact that we're not going uh, and couldn't and didn't have the ability to qualify means that we're hanging on to every, every time any player of Scotland breathes. Um, I think if we get over the first hurdle, then anything can happen. But I don't want anybody stupid enough to underestimate Peru and Iran and teams like that. Will you personally be rooting for Scotland? Of course. They're the nearest thing that I've got in the World Cup. I'd Do be rooting for you if you were there. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, uh, even with all that pressure, that there's a chance that Scotland will maybe lift something? He's got to get his priorities right, because they've been under, they've been under this so-called pressure, but a lot of it, you know, incited on their own behalf. Mm. Um, I'm sick of seeing them, you know, sponsoring cars, or rubbing somebody's T-shirts on the backsides, or wearing somebody's ties, or whatever it is. You've got to get your priorities right in this game. All those things come after you've won, and they come even more. But if you lose sight of, you know, the home internationals is the best example I can give. They've got, so, they've got one eye off the field and they've got one eye on it. And I've never seen a, a good one-eyed player in my life. What are your fears for the coming World Cup? I don't know, I'm not too keen on the place it's being played, obviously. Um, Why not Argentina? Well, there's a lot of question marks, how they run their country and that type of thing. I don't want any trouble and I, I wouldn't even suggest there could be any. But um, if we're going to stage a showpiece of my industry, or even yours, or ours, whichever way you want to put it, I would like it to have been in the safest, nicest place so everything could have been portrayed as we would like it to be. I can understand the players who don't want to go because I'm not over keen on, you know, wanting to go at all. I'd much prefer to be on a beach in the close season with Barbara and my children than going to the World Cup. I mean, that includes someone like Johan Cruyff who's at the top of his tree at the moment and he said, I'm not going to go. You can sympathise with that, can you? I, I don't know whether I can sympathise with it, uh, but I can perfectly understand it. Mm. He's got, a, he's got a, a choice and a right to do exactly as he sees fit. He's played in World Cups, he's done his profession reasonably proud, he's a highly skilled and talented young man. The fact he's drawn a fortune out of it is only due to his talent. Mm. I don't want anybody turning around and saying that, oh, he's not going now having made a lot of money out of it. You know, there's... There's, there can't be one set of rules for some professions and then another set for another. I fully understand him not wanting to go. Brian Clough. Incidentally, Brian is still on that family holiday in Spain with Barbara and the children, and that's the reason he misses a spectacular party and a spectacular This Is Your Life, where a little bird tells me that it's one of his friends who's the subject tonight. This Is Your Life, of course, which immediately follows this programme. Brian Clough, and we're delighted to say that he'll be joining the ITV team regularly a little later on in the World Cup. In fact, he joins us for one of uh, Poland's games, and I'm sure you're all going to remember a little affair he had with a Polish goalkeeper named Tomaszewski in 1973. You remember how Brian called him a clown. Well, I reminded Brian that Tomaszewski was still in the Polish side for this World Cup. How is he? He's in pretty good form. He's kept his is place he? nicely for four years, even though... And he's still in the side? He's still in the side. First-team goalkeeper? First-team goalkeeper. It's you, incredible. You called him a clown. I had more stick from the people of the Polish fraternity in Derby who served the cheese in the corp than you could ever believe. Um, it's a staggering performance if he's still in the side, and I'm delighted for him. 
it seems a good moment to take a break. And after it, we're going to take a close look at Scotland's first opponents, Peru, Iran and Holland. We're going to hear from the most famous Dutch footballer of all, Johan Cruyff. Kevin Keegan gives us his six players to follow. The top names coming up after this break. Well, welcome to our World Cup preview programme. We've joined Scotland in their training camp. We've heard from a confident Ali McLeod. But what about the teams that stand between Scotland and the second round? In Group 4, remember, they're joined by Holland, Iran and Peru. And their first match is on Saturday against Peru. You can see it live on ITV at 8.15. It's being played in the Cordoba Stadium, which was built especially for the World Cup. It's in the shadows of the mountains, some 400 miles from Buenos Aires. The magnificence of the new architecture is matched by the lushness of the new pitch. The stadium holds some 50,000 spectators, and the inevitable moat is there to ensure that none of them actually get onto the pitch itself. And in any case, everywhere, there are the watchful eyes of the security guards. Peru, in fact, have uh, a reasonable advantage playing fairly close to home in South America. And they also have a side stacked with experience. Several of their men having starred in the 1970 World Cup finals in Mexico. Well away from the rioting and civil unrest in their own country during the past few days, the Peruvians look relaxed and happy, here getting onto the World Cup roundabout in a big way. This is their veteran defender, Hector Chumpitas. He'll be looking for the form that made him a star in Mexico eight years ago, even though he's now 34. Getting into the swing of things, 21-year-old Roberto Mosquera, a forward who will celebrate his birthday during the tournament, as in fact does Cesar Cueto, who will be 26 and plays in midfield. Joining them is forward Ernesto Labath. Believe it or not, he'll be 22 on Friday. I wonder if they're going to have something rather special to celebrate. I think not, because I think Scotland should be able to beat Peru on Saturday night. But don't, as Brian Clough said, underestimate Peru. A number of people did just that in 1970 when Peru reached the quarterfinals as they were then. Just look at the goals they scored then against Bulgaria and Brazil, all scored by Chumpitas and Kubilas, who are both playing in Argentina again. Extraordinary pantomime going on here. Javenjev being told to go away. He, in fact, was lining up trying to find the wall up so that Severnov could see. Chumpitas! He scores! Next is Rifflin. Ken Kubiak. Kubiak still. Oh, look at his control. What a goal! What a goal! Peru given possession. Sotillo. Sotillo. Sotillo through. No. But Kubiak! Oh, let me repeat that warning, don't underestimate Peru. That's Scotland versus Peru, Saturday night at 8.15, and then next Wednesday night, also at 8.15, Scotland meet Iran. And again, it'll be a major surprise if the Scots are beaten. Iran, of course, are an underdeveloped football nation, but at least they had the benefit of playing in a weak qualifying group. But nonetheless, they are there in Argentina. Back home, Iran have a training camp where they've been preparing for the World Cup for a year. Naturally enough, it seems under the gaze of security guards. It's a setup that many managers would envy. This is their manager, Heshmet Moharajeni, a 38 year old former police officer. <laughs> Iran's star player is 23-year-old Hassan Roshan, who's a striker with a good scoring record, and clearly he's a man Scotland would, would do well to watch next week. 
Hassan lives in a fine new home in Tehran. Inevitably, there are the football trophies on display. And there, too, is his lovely wife, Fereshte. And what about that for a car? Just one of the trappings of success in Iran football. Even so, there is the shopping to be done, though it does appear to be plenty of choice in this particular fruit market in Tehran. The atmosphere in the Iran camp has been relaxed all along as they went for a picnic at a break to training. And how about this for a game? Could that be World Cup winning food? Well, will Iran be singing on Saturday night? Yes, if they can do to Scotland what they did here to Kuwait in the qualifying round. A goal here scored by that striker, Hassan Roshan. So Scotland face Iran next Wednesday and then the following Sunday Scotland play their last qualifying game and that's against Holland at Mendoza. Holland the beaten finalists in 1974 and amazingly enough they have nine of their beaten side in action again. Their manager is Ernst Happel. As they've been preparing over the past few days there's been growing confidence in their camp. They could turn out to be not only the most dangerous side in the whole World Cup but the most entertaining as well as indeed they were in 1974. Moving nicely, Sylvia's out in the outside right position for the cross. Does number one, Johnny Rip, Rip for scorer. Nayskov's coming to meet it, too high for Janssen and Rip sticks it in. Rip the break down for Von Hannigan. Strife, but he's all right, he's all right for number one. Johan Strife. Carnavalli up, we got only a small touch. Throw! That will do! Oh, that was a whacker! Naiskins. Christ. Naiskins gone on into the box again, going for it. And it's there! That might have been Naiskins, it might have been Luis Pereira, but Naiskins is getting the credit for it. Is. Well, the two Dutchmen who are missing this time are indeed Johan Cruyff, the master, uh, that brilliant star of 1974 who's now retired from the game, and Wim van Hannigan, the midfield man who decided not to go when he couldn't be guaranteed a first-team place. Now, whatever the merits of that decision, the emotion of it got the better of Wim van Hannigan when he broke down on Dutch television last weekend. He'd been asked to look on the bright side of things and look forward maybe now to next season to forget all about the mess he got himself into. But that really was too much for Wim van Hannigan. Well, that's how the World Cup gets hold of you, and that's one of the most emotional moments, presumably, in the life of Wim van Hannigan. And I'm sure there are going to be plenty more emotional moments between now and June the 25th in Argentina. So, a Dutch team that's likely, I think, to be a test for the very best in Argentina in the coming weeks, even without Johan Cruyff. And goodness knows, Dutch officials tried long and hard to persuade Cruyff to play in Argentina, but the superstar was adamant that he would not compete in this World Cup. Instead, when he's not with us here in London, Johan Cruyff will be watching the World Cup on television in his villa near Barcelona. What is it that keeps the world's greatest player away from football's greatest event? What about the pressures in the World Cup? And what about the teams that you should watch most closely? But above all, why isn't Johan Cruyff playing himself? Well, to play a World Cup is very difficult, first. And the, the most important part not is the, it's not the physical way or the football way. The most important part is the mental, mental way. Mm -hmm. And um, to play there, <coughs> your mentality must be 200% World Cup. And I've got it. That's why it's the best way for everybody that I won't go. Why haven't you got that now? I mean, you had it in 1974, you haven't got it in 1978. Because it was something new, something special. It was the first time. We had a lot of success. 
the best route you could wish. But afterwards, I said, well, nearly, I think a week or two weeks afterwards, I said, well, I've done it once. And I can't do it again because it took me more or less a year to get over it. Really? Yeah. Is there any one player that you, as you watch from your television set here in Spain, there's one player that you're particularly looking forward to seeing? Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot about uh, a few players. One is the Brazilian player, Zico. Uh, the other one is, um, is uh, Dalquist. Dalquist, of Scotland. Dalquist, because, uh, well, last year everybody in England was writing that Kevin Keegan was going and they bought another one and uh, now they, uh, they won the European Cup. They said he had a great season, so I want to see him. Where are the super teams, do you think, in this World Cup? Which are the, which are the three or four teams that you think, watch out for them because they could win it? Argentina, because they're playing their home games. And I know in their home games, the public, they are crazy. They will help them a lot. Will that put pressure on them, though, at the same time, do you think? I don't think so. They're used to this pressure and they, well, this public there is, is different as, as, as any country we know. Is it, is, it the most, is it the most difficult country to go to in the world to play as an away side yes. in Argentina? Yes, I think so. Because these people are there. I've played there once and it's something well, incredible. Yes. And um, the other one must be Brazil because of the results here in Europe, because the way of playing. They play quite slowly game. And uh, if they score one goal, it's very hard to score another one. Very hard. They've got now a, a mixture of, 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 of of football, which says they're technical, they're good, always. And like you've seen in England, they're very hard now. Yes. That's why I think they must get quite far. So Argentina and Brazil. And then you've got to get the Euro Europe side. Right. If I got to choose two, I would choose Germany. And not because they've got a, a great team or they've got a great result, because results are bad. I mean, but the German, one, mentality, one. the German mentality is, is, is I don't know, You've seen it all in England, when they scored the last minute of the goal. You've seen it in, in, in Mexico when they played against England. They were losing three times and they won three for three. They, um, nearly every game, in the last five minutes, they score a goal. Because they've got something in their mentality, which I think not even any other country, they haven't got it. That's why I think they're still in the tournament, especially in the tournament. They, uh, they're very dangerous. Holland, I think they... They've got a great team because um, it's more or less the same team as uh, as Germany. That's that's crazy to more anybody. Or less, well, more or less. I mean, without I without more you, or less. Yeah. without <laughs> without me, without Van Hanegem now. So more or less the the, the experience are there, and uh, the individuals, for instance, Rensebring is there. Rep could be. The other one is Van de is great. The midfield, it's. Very strong. I think the strongest part of the team. So I think they, as a team, they are very strong, and will be very big, very difficult to beat them. And they can score a goal any any moment. Mm -hmm. I think this is the, one of the most important thing. And I think this is the is one of the things which uh, not even one team has got. That it's such a a block, mm -hmm. such a such a, a team, mm -hmm. a team. Not individual players, but as a team. Are you convincing yourself that Holland could win the World Cup? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> They're in the same group as Scotland. Now, there's a lot of euphoria in Scotland. They believe that they can win the World Cup. I mean, is that extravagant, or do you see Scotland as a possible World Cup winner? The mentality must be like this, because if it's not like this, it's better you won't go. Um, I think the chance to get into the second round, it's quite big. It's big. Well, for me, the two teams is Holland and Scotland. They've got into the second round, but the teams who are going into the second round, I think it's a gamble. Johan Cruyff, who will be with us on ITV for the weekend of the Scotland v Holland game, and that's the only appearance he'll make anywhere on television during the whole of the World Cup. Well, Johan has marked our cards, so far as the team to watch is concerned, uh, putting special emphasis on those two giants from South America, Argentina and Brazil. And Argentina have already announced their side for their opening game, which is against Hungary, on Friday night. It includes René Hausmann, who indeed was a scorer for them in the 1974 World Cup. Good running here by Hausmann. Oh, what a beautiful goal! That was a spectacular goal! 
Brazil, we know well. Against England at Wembley last month, they showed moments of true magic. They showed a fair bit of ugly tackling as well, and I'm just wondering how much of that they'll get away with in this World Cup. But the goal they scored at Wembley was marvellous. A magnificent build-up, right really from their own half of the field. And here we are now inside the England half, and the ball is now played to the magical Rivellino. Look at that. What about that? And it comes to Jill, and he carves his way inside Trevor Cherry with an unstoppable shot there. But that's the only goal that Brazil got on that night. Strangely, though, nobody seems to have a good word to say for Italy, the team that knocked out England. They left Rome a few days ago, very depressed, after just one poor performance against Yugoslavia. They are so up and down, the Italians. But their spirits will soon be soaring if they can score goals of the quality of this one scored by Roberto Bettiga. It's in a warm-up game in Argentina a couple of days ago. What about that? A fantastic back heel there against an Argentinian second division side in the Boca Stadium. And if only he can do this for Italy, well, then maybe they'll be in with a shout in Argentina as well. And indeed, Italy's first game is against France. That's on Friday. It's exclusive and it's live to ITV, 5.30 on Friday. But now what about the individual players to watch? The men who in the next three and a half weeks could really make themselves into international sportsmen of great repute. That's an assignment we've given to Kevin Keegan for the very good reason that Kevin is in a unique position so far as England players are concerned of knowing the best players in the world as friends as well as opponents. Kevin, what yardstick did you use in picking these six players to watch in the World Cup? Well, I've tended to pick the players who I've played against over the last two years, either with England or with my club Hamburg. And I feel that um, the best way to judge a player as a professional is when you play against him. Not what you hear about him, not what you read about him, but when you actually played against him, you know what the player's capable mm. of doing. You know what he's good at, you know what he's bad at. And I think that's the best way to judge him. Right, let's go through the list then. First of all is, is Franco Causio of Juventus in Italy. You played twice against him, of course, in the World Cup for uh, England Italy. Yeah, I played twice against him. I also met him socially last week. And, um, Where was that? In Lugano in Italy, or oh, in Switzerland. And um, I find that he's so unlike the other Italian players in that he is a pure footballer. He doesn't have the hardness. He has more the skill factor and less of the hardness. And uh, that's what I really like about him. Right, this is Franco Causio of Juventus and Italy. He's 29 years old, a winger. He's got over 30 caps for Italy including two in the World Cup finals in West Germany in 1974. What do you like about him, Kevin? I like the way he can turn simple situations, like this one, into a goal. This is incredible. There Not many players can do this. Yeah, he flicks it through. It, it looks simple, but he's put a player there from midfield, clear through. Against England in Rome. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I've seen this one. Better his goal. Here again, you'll see how he can make something out of nothing. He goes up for a challenge, he's, he's brave, he's quick, he's brave again there. And now look how he finds the time to look up around him. He knows everything that's going on. And then he puts in a good cross. So dangerous. And just to prove that there is something in the way of an end product, if you give this guy this sort of room, he'll go in the box and he'll punish you where it really hurts. The second player you've chosen, uh, Kevin, is Kenny Dalglish of Liverpool and Scotland. Yeah, I think um, this World Cup could obviously be his World Cup. I think he's a great player. And in some ways, I regret not having had the chance to play with him at Liverpool. But he's done a great job. He scores goals. He makes goals. And he's, he's a class, a world-class player, no doubt about that. Well, he's the man who replaced Kevin at Liverpool. This is Kenny Dalglish of Scotland. Kenny is 27 and will break the Scottish cap record with his first appearance in Argentina, beating Dennis Law's total of 54 caps. He's got tremendous ability to shield the ball. A lot of people say he doesn't have the strength sometimes, but if you look here, he battles for everything. Watch this, this is classy. He sends Mickey Droy six ways, and this is pure football. It's a great goal. He's so good at chipping people. He makes good goalkeepers look bad, actually. A goal against Chelsea, there. And he's not, you know, he's not art, really renowned for hard work. But here he shows you. He starts this one himself on the centre circle. This is the famous goal against Wales that put Scotland into the finals in Argentina. And he sees the space and he leaves Joey Jones. And you can't blame Joey for this. And people say he's bad at Edinburgh, but uh, 
That doesn't look too bad to me. It's a great one. The next fellow you know very well, Sepp Meyer of Bayern Munich and West Germany. He's a real character. One of the real characters in football. And, and the day he comes out between the sticks and leaves football, it'll be a very sad day for football. Mm. Not only a great character, but also a great goalkeeper. These days, wearing a very similar hairstyle to yours. Well, he's like most of us. He's trying to make himself look younger all the time. <laughs> right, this is Sepp Meyer, the West German goalkeeper. At 34, Sepp is the oldest member of the German World Cup squad. He's played in both the last two World Cups, capped 83 times, and believe it or not, he's not missed a league match since August 1966. For years now, people have been trying to say that Sepp Meyer isn't world class, but I think his record stands up for his son. He's a great goalkeeper. It takes a great shot to beat him. Look at this. I mean, the guy's jumping up. He thinks he's scored, but he's not accounting for the fact that Sepp Meyer's in between the sticks. A lot of people, too, have said he's weak on crosses. But as he proves here, if you stand him up there, he'll come all day and take him. He's so technically right in everything he does. I think also the main point, main strength of his goalkeeping for me is his bravery. I think all goalkeepers, they say, got to be a bit crazy, but I think brave's a better word to use. Look how quickly he sees the danger here. And he smothers it. He's not going to be first there, but he's not going to be beaten. And then, as if that's not enough, He's off again, look. That's great goalkeeping. He's, he's great at adapting to situations. About the only thing that's beat him this year is this one here. And he's the first keeper ever to be out for a duck in Germany. The next play you've chosen is one maybe that's not that well known. Michel Platini of Nancy and France. Uh, and yet you've first-hand experience of Platini as well, haven't you? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> he scored a hat-trick against my club Hamburg in Parc de Prince uh, in February. A great player. I think if I had to pick one out of all the players in the World Cup who's going to come on through it, I think, I think it's Platini. Providing France go a long way. Yeah. He's a great player. Right, this then is Michel Platini. Platini will be 23 during the World Cup. He's seen here with his wife Christelle, who he married just before Christmas, in their new apartment overlooking Nancy. He's a midfield player and a free kick specialist. And indeed he scored the only goal in the French Cup final this season. A new face to many, but as Kevin says, we shall know a lot about him by the end of June. Michel Platini is going to be, for me, the star of the tournament, as I said, providing France get a good run. There he is, number 10. Number 10 here. Look, he could have played it early there, but he's going to... Look how he commits three players and then gives the guy the simple chance, Rocheter, and sticking this one in against Switzerland. Great player. He makes a lot of time for himself. He had three people around him a lot of times in Argentina. I think so. I think he's good. That's the only thing I fear about. He might get kicked out of it. But look, look at the skill here. He turns so well. He goes at people now. You think he might pass it here, but he's going to have a go. And he's got such a great shot from this distance. A bit unlucky with that one. It was rising. Now we see him again. He's always hanging around on what we call depth outside the box. Here he is now. He's, what, 30 yards out? Takes it two, three steps. And he's got such a powerful shot. Just look at this for a goal. Robbie Rensenbrink of Anderlecht, the Belgian club, and Holland, is another player who's given you a bit of trouble this season. Yes, unfortunately, there seems to be so many of them around. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he scored the goal in the 1-1 draw at our stadium. The 1-0 win there in our stadium in the Cup Winners' Cup. Which, and um, he caused a lot of problems. He's a, he's a guy who got the ability to make good players look almost stupid at times. Robbie Rensenbrink. And we'll see the goal that Robbie scored against Hamburg in a moment. He's probably Europe's outstanding winger of the last few years. He played in and was injured in the 1974 World Cup final against West Germany. A scorer of two goals in this year's Cup Winners Cup final. We'll see one of those as well. Robbie Rensenbrink is now 30 years old and he's won 33 caps for Holland. Kevin. Yeah, Hedden isn't one of his abilities as you just saw, but this is committing players, looking for the break. This is the goal against Hamburg. Yeah, this one really hurts, actually. I don't really want to see it too much, but look at the way he goes into the box. And what's he going to do? He's going to cheekly us. If it wasn't against my club, I think I would stand up and clap for that one. It's a great goal, great marksmanship, great finishing. I said before, he's got the ability to make players look stupid. There's a guy here just about to go and catch one of his buses. Look, so simple and yet so deadly. He's through. And free kicks. Yeah, this, this, if anybody gives three kicks to go away against Holland, they can expect something like this. He can't half bend a ball. Look at this one. It's going two yards wide at the moment. It bends right in and the keeper just about breaks his skull on the post. And that was a cup in his cup final. Yeah, he scored two goals, but that was a peach. Mm. 
You've also played this season against Zico of Flamenco, the Rio Club and Brazil, who is your last choice in your six to follow in the World Cup. Yeah, I've played against him and also saw him play against West Germany in Hamburg. A great player and obviously the further Brazil go, the more, the more dangerous this guy's going to be because he, he's got everything. One, two, shoot, finishing, de he's deadly. Great player. A lot of people make Brazil the favourites and Zico is one of the reasons why. Zico is now 25 and has been hailed as another Pele. The current South American Player of the Year, he's here with his family. He's a forward whose power and speed was evident on Brazil's recent European tour. Kevin. Yeah, he's a great player. Here's Zia Maria with the ball. This is against West Germany in Hamburg. Yeah, in Hamburg. There's, There's Zico. Zico, number eight. What a cheeky little ball. Everybody else thought he was going to knock it square. He plays it through and he makes a goal really out of nothing against the champions or the favourites for the next World Cup. The pictures in this piece aren't the best quality, but the football is absolutely first class. Here he is, he's running at people. It's against Bolivia, it's a great goal. Now. You just cannot give this guy two or three yards room like that, or he'll, he'll do that every time. He's got a tremendous shot. And just to prove that wasn't a fluke, in the same game, again he's running at people. This time a cheeky little one-two here. And this really is a typical Brazilian goal. And look at the power of the finishing. That's tremendous. Mind you, Pelé. So there are Kevin's six to follow. Causio of Juventus in Italy. Kenny Dalglish of Liverpool and Scotland. Sepp Meyer of Bayern Munich and West Germany. Michel Platini of Nancy in France. Robbie Rensenbrink of Anderlecht and Holland. And Zico of Flamenco and Brazil. You say that uh, Platini is the one that you're looking forward to seeing more than anybody else there. Yeah, I, I think mainly because too many people haven't heard about him yet. The lad's got so much ability. He's got, he does so many things that are good. And I think Zico obviously is the big challenge to him because Brazil are a better side probably than France. Mm. But for me, Platini, if France gets through, is going to be the revelation of the World Cup. One thing I must ask you on the eve of the World Cup, though, is how you now rate Kenny Dalglish's chances and indeed Scotland's chances. Well, I think I think it's any one of five teams in it, and I think Scotland are in that five. I think a lot of people in Germany, in Europe as a well, whole, fancy Scotland. A lot more people than I think the Scots even realise. And um, I think they've got a good group. They've got a couple of easy games to get them on the way. And uh, quite honestly, I, I, I can see him going all the way. And as an Englishman, it doesn't hurt me because I think they deserve to be there. A fascinating insight to the world's great players that you'll be able to watch with us over the next three and a half weeks from Kevin Keegan. And Kevin, of course, is with us again for the opening ceremony and that first match, West Germany against Poland tomorrow. Finally, the very latest news from Argentina and reaction to a story carried in certain newspapers this morning that Brian Clough's job as England youth manager could be in jeopardy because of how little time he's spent with them since his appointment. Suggestions that were firmly knocked on the head by England manager Ron Greenwood speaking to us in Argentina this afternoon. Brian Clough hasn't elected to go on holiday and not go away with the England youth team. The England youth team went to Poland and failed to qualify for the uh, semi-finals uh, whilst Brian was still involved with Nottingham Forest. The mere fact that Brian hasn't been able to be associated with the youth team this year at all has been only related to the fact that every time we've had a youth match at uh, England youth level, Nottingham Forest have had a very big important game and it was impossible for uh, him or Peter to be involved. So and you must remember, Brian's future is still with the England youth team? With me, as far as, well, I don't know what's been said back home in the English press. All I know is that Brian Clough is still a member of the team I selected and a very important member which firmly answers that story. Let's get the latest World Cup betting, which comes to us from Ladbrokes, where Brazil are the favourites at 9-4. to four. At 4-1 four to one tonight are Argentina, 7-1 to one West Germany, 8-1 to one Holland, which confirms the four nations that Johan Cruyff tipped us about. They are the top four there. 9-1 to one Scotland, 14-1 to one Italy and Poland, 20-1 to one Hungary, 22 to 1 France, that seems to me a reasonable bet. 25 to 1 Spain, 40 to 1 Sweden, 50 to 1 Peru, 66 to 1 Austria, that's not a bad outsider either. 100 to 1 Mexico, 500 to 1 Iran, and 1,000 to 1 Tunisia. What about the referees? They've got a very important part to play and a very difficult job to do in Argentina. And Angel Corezza of Argentina, he's been named as the man to referee tomorrow's World Cup opener between West Germany and Poland. Scotland's first game, Ulf Eriksson of Sweden handles that one against Peru on Saturday night. 
The first game for Clive Thomas of Wales will be Sweden against Brazil on Saturday. John Gordon of Scotland kicks off with Tunisia and Mexico on Friday. And England's Pat Partridge has to wait until next week for his first match. And as expected, there'll be massive security for tomorrow's opening World Cup game, West Germany against Poland. All roads surrounding the River Plate Stadium, capacity of 75,000, will be closed four hours before the 7 o'clock kickoff. Police will be on duty outside the ground eight hours before the start. That's it. I hope very much that we've been able to whet your appetite a little bit for the World Cup. And don't forget to join me again then for the opening ceremony and the first game, West Germany against Poland, tomorrow evening at 5.45. But was it really four years ago that the last whistle sounded and the last World Cup? Good night. World Cup 78, one minute promotion, production number 44989, data recording 315578, take one. The River Plate Stadium in Buenos Aires is a last rehearsal for tomorrow's spectacular opening of the 1978 World Cup. The colourful pageantry of it all is a curtain raiser for what promises to be an equally excellent first match. It's the holders West Germany against Poland. Can the Poles spring a surprise against the out-of-form holders? In 1974, Poland were amongst the most skillful teams. Poland. Belia, what a goal! But even though the Germans are struggling at the moment, they can produce moments of eye-catching magic. What about this for an overhead kick that leads to a goal by Klaus Fischer? So, will it be Germany or will it be Poland? You can see the whole of the game live on ITV at 7 o'clock. And joining me is Kevin Keegan. And nobody knows the players better than Kevin. It's a great lineup. The World Cup opening ceremony at 5.45. The opening match at 7 o'clock. I'll see you tomorrow.